between our two players and kicking off the Pokemon action here of day two of the region finals for North America. We've got coming out of their Pokeballs, it's Urshifu and Clefairy facing down against Grimmsnarl and Torkoal. So very interesting to see the Torkoal straight out here on the field, of course, going to set the sun, bring a little bit of sunshine to the field for Nick, paired up with the Grimmsnarl. But vinjay has got that Urshifu on the field of Pokemon that can deal so much damage. And of course, Nick won't have the option to protect. No, that's the one thing that you have to worry about if you are the Torkoal here. You, you're going to be very defensively built anyway, but you are technically going to take a lot of damage from the Surshifu. I'm always saying that there is the Grim Snarl on Nick's side of the field, and that does, if it carries something like Spirit Break, it will threaten the Urshifu uh, to do big damage onto it. But again, at the same time, the, the Torkoal, if you don't check it, you've got to, can really threaten with that big, powerful eruption that it does threaten here in the sun already set through that drought ability. Well, Clefairy going for what we know it does best, going for that follow me, just trying to redirect in attacks and potentially protect the Urshifu from anything that the Grimmsnarl wants to go for. Of course, Torkoal known for going for spread type moves. The um, follow me isn't going to help out there, but Urshifu going to go straight for the Wicker Blow, targeting down into that Torkoal, going to reduce the potential damage of an eruption, of course, getting a critical hit as it is um, the Wicked Blow move. Torkoal is going to be able to activate its berry, regain a little bit of HP thanks to the Citrus Berry, and instead actually go straight for the Yawn. So Clefairy, if it doesn't switch out the end of this turn for Binjay, then it's going to be falling asleep. Yeah, a little bit of a passive turn here from Nick. He hasn't really got much offense on the field yet, but a very good setup turn. You know, he's got the Yawn onto the Clefairy. It's a, we've seen how good Clefairy can be as a Pokemon, really disruptive with those redirections. And it's something that you want to deal with straight away. Now we'll make it Nick's play there with the Yawn is almost forcing Benji to either go for a, another redirect here and allow the Clefairy to go to sleep or force a switch. And this is something that Nick can try and maybe take advantage of. He's got the Reflect up with his Grimmsnarl. Is he going to go for the Light Screen? Has he got other mm -hmm. options where he can maybe target down the Urshifu here, thinking that the redirection isn't going to be a possibility with that Clefairy if it does switch out on Benji's side of the field? Exactly. You can see Nick taking every last second there to really lock in his moves. Clefairy going to go for that helping hand, though, so it is going to stay around, potentially fall asleep at the end of this turn as the Urshifu does go for a Nuller Wicker Blow, but this time helping hand boosted. So going to be dealing even more damage, and that is enough to be able to pick up a KO against that tool call and just remove the threat from the field. Of course, it does give Nick the option to bring in a Pokemon from the back to apply pressure going forward, and the helping hand from the Clefairy left the Urshifu exposed to take that Spirit Break. You can see the special attack dropping on the Urshifu by I don't think it's going to worry about that too much. Yeah, and you can see here how beneficial that friend guard ability is on that Clefairy. Normally that, that Spirit Break would be enough to take down the Urshifu, but because of the friend guard, just giving a little bit more in those defense stats for Urshifu, able to hang on and take another turn. But the one bad thing here for Benji is he has got Clefairy sitting on the field and it is now sleeping. It can't do anything, and that's not really what you want from your Clefairy. You want it to be active, be able to disrupt your opponent, and right now it's not causing any pressure to Nick. So he has lost a top call it's not the best situation or the start to the game for him but he's not in a bad situation at all now able to bring in a fresh pokemon and really start ramping up the the the, the momentum here with that clefairy out of action Again, Nick really taking his time to think through which Pokemon from the back he wants to be able to bring through here. The problem is Benjay still does have that Urshifu that can apply a lot of super effective damage to the Pokemon that Nick has chosen to bring to this battle. Uh, but Grimmsnarl, we know that it does um, often have access to something like a Sucker Punch, so that could potentially deal some damage to that very low HP um, Urshifu, maybe even trying to pick up the KO. Yeah, and that's a, that's a worry here for Binjay. If, if he wants to preserve the Urshifu for later in this game, it might be worth switching it out and just allowing the Clefairy to maybe go down. It's not really performing any sort of role at the minute. It's not likely to wake up this next turn. So allow that to go down and try and get something onto the field that can start to pressure the, the Glastria before it starts to get these chilling nays uh, boosts that it's, we all know it's very capable of. Yeah, and we've seen before how once those boosts on the Glastria start sort of rolling up, then it becomes such a formidable threat to deal with, particularly if it is Dynamax, and that's exactly what Nick has gone for here. Going to, of course, double the HP stat and allow that Glastria that little bit of extra protection in the face of the Urshifu, um, just so it doesn't have to take as much damage as 
um, as the Urshfood wants to. The Clefairy there, of course, going to be taking its turn of sleep as the Urshfood does go for that wicked blow. Glastry, you can see it does so much damage. The extra HP from being in Dynamax really going to help out with the longevity of this Glastia. Burning Jealousy coming in from the Grim Snog, going to be able to pick up the KO against that Urshfood. So no more worries for Nick that that Pokemon's on the field and does a little bit of damage to the, Clef the Clefairy. But of course, Max Hailstorm going to be able to do the bulk of the damage here, taking it down to about a third of HP remaining. So Clefairy hasn't got long on the field remaining if it's still going to be the target of the next couple of turns from Nick. Yeah, and I don't mind that turn from Benji. You know, he does lose the Urshifu, but what he's got in return for the Urshifu there, the trade almost, he's taken down a Torkoal and he's done some very nice damage to what would be otherwise a big threat in the, the Glastria here as we see the Nihiligo take the field for Benji in place of that fallen Urshifu. Yeah, Nihiligo was a Pokemon that we really got to highlight yesterday. Um, you know, with the Meteor Beam and Power Herb combination, it can be such a threat. Um, and that's something that, you know, the Grimstone and the Glastia have to be a little bit wary of. Yeah, and the Grimstone on, it's already set the light, the reflector, but it would be interesting to see if it goes for a light screen here. More predominantly, the Nihiligo on Benji's side is going to be going for those special type attacks, and they will be threatening the Glastria as well. Obviously, an Ice type is weak to Rock type attacks, so it needs to be careful there. But as long as this Clefairy is sitting on the field, even though it's sleeping, and I've seen been saying it's been very passive, it does still have that Friend Guard activated, which is also supporting the Nihiligo, which is also very nice, but has to be wary of a Max Quake from this Glastria. Again, you can see Nick trying to debate which Pokemon he wants to target with his Glastria. Um, Grimmsnarl going to go for the light screen, so just going to protect the Glastria from any of those special type attacks that the Nihiligo wants to go for. And it is indeed going for that Meteor Beam. Would not be surprised in the slightest to see the Power Herb activate after, of course, Nihiligo gets that special attack boost, which is one of the best parts of this Com combination of attacks in the synergy of this turn. Going to be going for the Meteor Beam into the Glastria. The Light Screen really paying off there, able to allow Glastria to survive and fire off a Max Quake in retaliation. Going to go straight down into that Nihiligo, being able to pick up the solid one-hit KO. We know there's no Focus Sash, obviously, on that opposing Nihiligo. And not only will the Grimmsnarl and the Glastria be able to get their special defense boost, we know that Glastria is also going to get an attack boost thanks to the Chilling Nay ability. So Nick is starting to put the pieces together to allow this Glastria to be in the best position possible to start picking up even more KOs as we continue this game one. Yeah, he's making very good use of his Glastria right now, you know, and picking up knockouts where they matter. It has taken a lot of damage, in, and Benji had done a very good job in, in really wearing it down and putting it into a position now where it can potentially be knocked out by the Cartana that has just hit the field. Um, but also, it has to be very wary about the burning jealousy that we have had revealed from the Grimmsnarl behind mm -hmm. the Reflect as well. The Grimmsnarl is going to be very difficult for the Cartana to deal with. Maybe you see a, a Max Steel Spike from the Cartana go into that Grim Snarl slot and hope that the, the Clefairy wakes up with a helping hand boost that could potentially pick up the knockout there, get a defense boost and set you up in a good position with Cortana to start closing out the end of this game. So it's not over, but Nick really feels in a very strong position right now, especially with how he's managed the game up to this point. But like I say, the Cortana coming in complicates things for Nick. And if he uses it right, Benji uses it right, then it's going to be very difficult for Nick to kind of overcome this Pokemon. Yeah, the Clefairy's looking in a bit of a precarious position as well. Something like a Burning Jealousy with the Hail Chip could be enough to pick up the KO against it. Cortana, however, is going to be going for that Dynamax. Binjay has been able to preserve that for later in this game one. And that just allows Cortana the opportunity to potentially survive this um, Burning Jealousy. It's going to be a helping hand from the Clefairy that's just woken up and rejoined the action. And Max Steel Spike is going to be the move choice from that Cortana going down into the Grimmsnarl. And despite the Reflect, Grimmsnarl will be being KO'd. Clefairy found the opportune moment to come back into the action here and really help out Cartana to ensure the KO there. And of course, this is where we see that synergy again of boost. Not only has Cartana got a defense boost, thanks to its beast boost, it also gets that attack boost. So a lot of these statistics are raising up and we've got to make sure we keep track of them in all the action. Um, Max Hellstorm going to target down into that Cartana. And as you can see, thanks to that defense boost and sort of the natural defenses of the Cartana anyway, it's not dealing nearly as much damage as that Glastria needs it to be doing. 
Yeah, and you can see that the Clefairy now wakes up at the, the most opportune moment, Benji, and he is able to make the most of that with that help and hand boost onto the Cartana, getting rid of the Grimstar, which has been such a, a, a real threat to him, not offensively, but more of a support role as well, but did threaten with that Burning Jealousy, removing it, and like you say, getting those double boosts with the beast boost boosting the attack making Cartana even more threatening as Glastria now on Nick's end of the field has reverted back to its normal form and is in definite KO rate risk of getting knocked out this next turn mm -hmm. by the Cartana but the Dusclops coming onto the field does make things a little more interesting if it can get its trick room up it can maybe support the Glastria a little bit longer but I don't know if the Glastria is going to be able to take an attack behind a protect that you'd have to go for here yeah, that's the thing, even behind to protect, the max move will be able to go through that and inflict damage, and on the dwindled HP Glastery has got, I don't think it's going to be able to survive, but Nick's going to try for it anyway. The Cartana's going to go for a max and knuckle targeting down into that Glastery, and it is enough to pick up the KO, and this is actually a really secure play here by Binjay, because you're going to get the attack boost from the max knuckle, and then, hey, look, Cartana's going to get a nuller beast boost as well, and it does just allow the Cartana to be as offensively threatening as possible. You know, you're against the Dusclops, there's not normal Normally moves that Cortana have that can deal super effective damage to something like a Dusclops. It is very bulky and if it's got something like Pain Split as well, that can get really annoying very quickly. Um, so if you're Binjay, you need to be able to have as much offensive pressure as possible to try and KO this Dusclops nice and quickly. Yeah, and you maybe see now, I think if you're Cortana on Binjay's side, you want to try and set up the grassy terrain so at least you've got a little more offensive pressure against the Dusclops that we know is very well defensively built from, from just how generally it is run. So at least with the grassy terrain boost, you will be getting back HP for your Pokemon, but you will also be doing it for your opponent. But I think the boost that you will get access to from that will be very beneficial to kind of help them close this matchup. Well, Clefairy being very, very helpful, and Dusclops actually going for the bind here. Not a move we very often see on that Dusclops, as the Cartana, like you mentioned, Lee, going for that max overgrowth, going to be able to set up the grassy train and actually pick wow. up a solid <laughs> KO against that Dusclops. So just completely removes it from the field. And, you know, that means that Binjay is going to be able to take game one. Yeah, an incredibly good game one here from both players. And, and I really love Benji's approach to the game. It's very direct. There's not really any, you know, there's not too much switching. He doesn't want to mm -hmm. risk anything. He knows exactly what he's going to do. I like the way that he brought in the Nihiligo, took advantage of that, thought, I'm going to get as much damage off with my Urshifu as I can gets mm -hmm. much of a return we saw him do that he got the the Torko got rid of that he did some nice damage to the glass every four going down did the same almost with the Nihiligo thinking okay I just need to get this Glastria in range which really paid off in the end game because once the the Grim Snarl was in a position to be taken down as we saw the Clefairy wake up at the that mm -hmm. great moment with a helping hand to remove it from the field then it was it was always going to be very difficult I think especially because Binge had really stalled out the Dynamax turns from Nick's side mm -hmm. of the field and he still had the Dynamax ability to, to utilize himself which really in the end game made it very difficult especially when Nick was at that point where he tried to get the trick room up and if the Glastria had a little more health behind it it may have been a bit different but I think the way that the directness of how Benji approached that game was uh, like I say put it in a position where it wasn't able to really utilize the trick room once it did become a thing late in that game. Yeah, I want to really champion that Clefairy because it hung around on the match the whole time. Though It didn't get a KO. Despite being asleep for most of the match, it was still playing a crucial part. Being there on the field, having the friend guard ability will boost up the kind of defensive of its partner Pokemon. We saw that with the Spirit Break going into the Urshifu. We saw it with the Matt Tailstorm going into the Gartana. I mean, Gartana had some other bits of help as well with the defense boost and its natural defenses. But Clefairy was still playing a pivotal role there. And then, of course, when it woke up, going for those helping hands, really boosting the attack of that Gartana really did help. Binjay sort of close out that game one and you know it goes for helping hand that's because it's a helpful creature mm, and I think that goes more into Benji's uh, whole strategy there when you think of the Clefairy thing I really need to remove that as soon as possible mm -hmm. take away the redirection issue but you can't ignore the Pokemon sitting next to the Clefairy and I think Benji really positioned his board very well where you can't ignore Urshifu because it's going to get those wicked blows off and it's going to critical hit everything that it hits and the damage <laughs> will get too much if you let it get too much damage off. 
And the same with the Nihiligo as well when it came in very fast, very offensive. And obviously with that Meteor Beam combination, it's something, again, you can't ignore. If you do, then it's <laughs> it, it's, mm -hmm. an, it's an Ultra Beast. It's got the Beast Boost ability. It will start to get that momentum and then it gets a little bit too far for you. To, it, that's the thing. And then the Cartana coming on on top of that, you think, yeah, and where, where's the room then to concentrate onto the Clefairy? Do you concentrate mm -hmm. on it earlier on in the match? I think if you're Nick, maybe try and get the Trick Room up earlier. I think that might be a good way to, to deal with Binge's team. He has got the Clefairy, which is a very slow Pokemon, but I feel like Nick has the slow Pokemon that can really benefit from the Trick Room, and maybe in that environment, he can really prevent the offensive pressure that, mm -hmm. that Benji was putting on in, in that first game. So maybe a way for Nick to approach this next one. Well, um, it's going to be a tough one, whatever, because it's 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 a lot on the line here. If Nick loses this next one, then he is out of the tournament. So he has to, you know, the pressure is on for this one to get it right. Yeah, well, speaking of pressure, let's jump into game two and see exactly how our Pokemon trainers are going to be able to handle that pressure that you spoke of, Lee. Like you said, they are playing for a place in the global finals. And Benjay is just one game away from accomplishing that. So, uh, Shifu and Clefairy out on the field for Benjay once again. But it's going to be a change up from Nick. Grimmsnarl once again on the action, but he's traded out the Torkoal Sunsetter for Venusaur. And this makes me slightly suspicious that Torkoal could be in the back and would make a really nice switch in here for Nick to be able to set the sun, act the chlorophyll ability on that Venusaur and start causing a lot of trouble going for something like a sleep powder or even just going for something super duper offensive right off the bat. Yeah, it's got the option there to bring the talk on and like you say, get that chlorophyll ability activated and maybe even just Gigantamax the Venusaur because you can go for that G-Max Vine Lash attack and start getting that residual damage, which is the secondary effect to its, its Gigantamax signature move there. And you've also got the option to even go for a, a Max Ooze, which wouldn't be the worst thing in the world because it should feel unlikely to go to a Wicked Blot into the Grimmsnarl slot. So you can get mm -hmm. the Max Ooze onto the Clefairy, get a, a special attack boost onto your Venusaur and your Torkoal and set yourself up for the next turn to be very, very dangerous. Well, Nick going straight for the Dynamax here, on, or should I say the Gigantamax there, onto the Venusaur, going to let it change forms and apply a lot of pressure to Binjay's team here. Um, you know, something like a Max Ooze as well, going into that Clefairy will deal a huge chunk of damage and also then, of course, boost up the special attack for the next turn. But no switches on Nick's side. Clefairy, once again, being a good partner Pokemon and going for that helping hand, going to help out Urshifu with the damage potential as Reflect goes up once again for Grimmsnarl. But Wicker Blow just going to go straight through and do a huge amount Ooh. of damage. Ooh. onto that Venusaur, the helping hand boost really being so powerful, but Venusaur able to hang on and fire off the G-Max Vine Lash, almost picking up the KO against the Yoshifu, but I think the critical thing here is setting up that residual damage. Venusaur, however, obviously revealing itself to have the Life Orb as well. That's going to really eat into that very low HP that Venusaur has got. I don't think it's going to be sticking around for too long, but Urshifu straight away removed from the field with that extra residual damage. Yeah, and you can see the benefit of this, this Gigantamax signature attack here, removing the Urshifu from the field so quickly. You've taken a lot of damage in the process, but this is how we've seen Benji play. He wants to get the damage onto these, these Pokemon very early on and kind of set up for a late game sweep almost. He's bringing in the Rotom Heat now, which is... Uh a little bit problematic for the Venusaur because obviously it is threatened by the fire type attacks and I don't know if a Max Zeus will have enough to actually take it well take it down in one mm. hit especially if you switch in the Torkoal to get the sun and take advantage of that chlorophyll ability yeah, that's the thing. What is this Venusaur going to do? Is it going to be able to have the sun boosting up so it can go really, really quickly? But then, of course, you have to worry about the uh, Clefairy just going for that follow me. And I think essentially the Rotom's in a great position here where it could go for something like a nasty plot if it desires. You know, you've got the extra support there from the Clefairy to redirect away any attacks from that Grimmsnarl or the Venusaur. And then Binjay would be safe to potentially Dynamax it on the next turn. But Clefairy actually, you know, saying, I'm not helping you out for once. I'm going straight for the Protect as Venusaur goes for that Max Ooze targeting you down into the Clefairy. It's actually quite wise from the Clefairy, looking out for itself so it can stay around on the field and help out his partner Pokemon for longer in the match. But the critical thing here is, of course, the special attack boost that this Venusaur is getting. And if it is able to carry on into the next turn, you can see it hanging on by 2 HP, then it is going to be something to be concerned about. Binjay going for that nasty plot. So the Rotom now is going to be the concern for Nick. Yeah, and a really nice call there from you to say this is a good opportunity for that nasty plot, and that's exactly what we see. Nick's side, he is going for that spirit break to kind of try and mitigate those nasty plot boosts, and you can see again the, the, the G-Max Vine Lash 
residual damage here it is really starting to stack up especially onto that clefairy the venusaur on nick's side is in an awkward position now where it's going to have one last move that it can it, it can attack with before it will go down to that life or recoil that we've seen it taken in the previous two turns so this is going to be the last turn that nick's going to have access to his venusaur is he going to make the most of it maybe switching the problem is switching into the tall call now you're almost powering up the the, the rotom and allowing it the room mm. to maybe get another nasty plot off if you miss the knockout with uh, a max ooze which is your really real option to hit it with although the venusaur is plus one right now it can remove the clefairy off the field but you've also got to worry about maybe a cartana switching in to take that well, there is going to be a switch. Um, Binjay is going to spring in the Kartana, just like you said there, Lee. So depending on the target of this Venusaur, which will be, of course, his last turn, but also his last Dynamax turn as well. Nick has kind of been able to plan these out really well. It actually goes for the Max Quake. It's going to be boosting up the special defense of the Pokemon on Nick's side of the field, going straight into that Kartana, doing a huge chunk of damage, taking it down right into the red part of the HP bar. Um, you know, really good calling that switch. And they're not going for something like the Max Ooze, just in case the Kartana was going to be able to come in obviously being a steel type wouldn't have taken any damage from that poison type move and unfortunately for venusaur it has been ko'd by its own life orb and will be going back into its pokeball but binge you know really capitalizing on this and going for a second nasty plot um i believe this now puts it out plus three because it did take the spirit break previously but if there's a time to dynamite your rotom it may well be now definitely it feels like a good time to to dynamax it get it onto the field after Nick's Dynamax Gigantamax Pokemon has fallen and really take advantage of these stat boosts that you're you're about to see here. The Rotom is going to be difficult for Binji to the back. It's not really a Pokemon that you would bring in to deal with something like Rotom Heat. The residual damage is stacking up, but it, we're still yet to see what item the Rotom has there. Does it have something like a Citrus Berry? It could protect this turn and just get the, the residual damage, activate that Citrus Berry, and then Gigantamax the next turn because Cotton are not on the greatest spot here to really be doing very much because of that mm. huge max quake that we saw come out from the Venusaur. Yeah, that's the thing, Cartana. Not only is it in really low HP, it's also now at minus one thanks to the Intimidate of Landorus. So if you're Binge, I'd really be kind of aware that the residual damage from the Vine Lash is starting to stack up and you want to maybe try and capitalize on the HP you've got left and allow that Rotom to start dealing a huge amount of damage. Yeah, and I think the Intimidate here is really nice onto the Cartana, but you have to be very careful with your Landorus if you're Nick because it's a very important Pokemon for you right now. It feels like maybe one of the only ways that he's got to deal with the, the Rotom on the opposite side of the field. And because of the, the, the nasty pop boost that it's already got behind it, it's going to be very difficult, especially if it Dynamaxes here. So you've got to play around it, try and maybe get a Spirit Break off into it, reduce that Special Attack stat again. But with the Clefairy coming back onto the field, it really does <laughs> complicate things for Nick. Yeah, to be honest, I really like this switch by Binjay. You're preserving your Cortana in the back, resetting that Intimidate so that it can still have that offensive pressure that it needs later on in the match. And also, we've spoken many times about it before, Clefairy having that friend guard ability going to be able to really help out the Rotom potentially survive a Rock-type move from this Landorus. And isn't he going to be the Stone Edge? Does do a huge chunk of damage, able to connect, and we get to see the item reveal finally on that Rotom. It is going to be um, the Citrus Berry, so regaining a little bit of HP and being able to go for that Max Flare as well targeting down into the opposing landorus does a huge chunk of damage not enough to be able to pick up a ko uh, but it is critically setting up the sun so on the next turn these fire type moves are going to be dealing even more damage grim snarl just going to do a little bit more chip with the spirit break lowering one stage of special attack meaning the rotom is now you know only at plus two yeah, and, and now in a position where there's another Stone Edge from this Landorus, if it can get that off, it will be able to pick up the knockout onto the Rotom Heat. But the problem is now that benji has got the Clefairy on the field with that redirection next to it, and the Landorus we know will be moving first. So it's likely if it goes for another Stone Edge, it will be into that Clefairy slot, which means that the Rotom's free again to fire off another attack. And now with the Sun on the field, it makes things a little bit more difficult to uh, to deal with here because the, the grim snarls just not got the attacks we've seen spirit break we've seen burning jealousy they're not attacks that are going to be able to knock out this 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 uh, rotom heat in mm -hmm. the position that it's in right now and obviously the grim snarl has to feel a little bit threatened right now especially with this sun up on the field a max flare from this plus two rotom could potentially pick up a knockout even though the light screen is is on the field 
Yeah, exactly. And the Clefairy going to go for that follow me. Wisely going to redirect away a potential stone edge um, that would have maybe got the KO. But Lander is actually going to jump out of the action going for a fly. Um, so just going to jump up into the sky and avoid any damage from that Rotom that is indeed going for the Max Flare, but targeting down into this Grim Snarl. You were rightly to say the Grim Snarl has to be worried, but it can breathe a little sigh of relief. It's able to survive on 29 HP, targeting down into that Clefairy with the Spirit Break. Not enough to pick up the KO, though. And Clefairy's not going to worry about taking a special attack drop. It's mainly there, of course, for that help hand and follow me support yeah and i really like the play there from nick to use the fly to get the landers out of kind of harm's way for this turn to uh, maybe waste the dynamax move from benji's mm. side of the field but the problem is now the lander is going to use fly come back down and it's going to be very vulnerable to getting knocked out by that rotom which i'm assuming what's what we'll see here from the rotom heat on benji's side of the field well, Lander is going to return to the action, going for that fly into the Clefairy, is able to finally pick up the KO against it um, as it returns to its Pokeball as Max Flare comes out once again from this Rotom, but instead just going to target straight down onto that Grimmsnarl, removes it from play, doesn't want it to get up to any more difficulties, maybe going for another Spirit Break, you know, the Rotom wants to make sure that it keeps itself as sort of specially boosted as possible. But it does leave Nick free to now bring in his fourth and final Pokemon from the back, which is that Torkoal, and, um, you know, Torkoal doesn't need to activate the Sunshine, it's already there thanks to the Mac Flares and Binjay is able to bring in the Cortana and this is where things start to look a little bit difficult you know both Torkoal and the Landers can do super effective damage to the Pokemon on Binjay's side of the field yeah and one of the things if you are Benji, you've got the the speed advantage you definitely know that that landorus isn't scarfed on nick's side of the field so you can pick up a knockout there uh, but that would leave you vulnerable to getting uh, attacked very badly and uh, probably <laughs> knocked out from the talk call that we know is, is such a big threat here uh, we've already seen yawn from the the talk call we know that can, that can be something that could disrupt the rotom here from from that side of the field I don't really know what you would do with the landers if it is an assault vest variant it's it's pretty much a sitting duck at this point but you're kind of making the carton decide and have to knock it out to protect your rotom and then you're putting all your kind of eggs in one basket making sure that the rotom hopefully is enough to deal with this torque by itself well, it's going to be a Protect straight away coming up from the Rotom. No more Dynamax to play around with going through Protect, for example, as Cortana does indeed go for that Leaf Blade straight into the Landorus, able to pick up the KO against it. And of course, Cortana will now be able to get its Beast Boost and be at plus one attack, but may not be for long, depending on what this Torkoal's gone for. It's actually gone for Body Press into the Protect of the Rotom. So Cortana able to survive out the turn. And now Binjay is in a position where he can double target down into that Torkoal. Both of his Pokemon are boosted. It's going to be a lot of damage, Lee. Yeah, it's going to be it's going to be very difficult for the Torkoal to close this one out from here, even though the, the health on Benji's Pokemon are very low. I think with that Beast Boost, and you would imagine maybe playing as recklessly as you did there with the Cortana it may indicate something like a Focus Sash to uh, allow it to take an attack. But we do see the double up here and the, the Torkoal managing just to survive. So very good training here by Nick. I mean, Torkoal once again going for that body press, targeting you down into the Rotom. I mean, that's the thing with Torkoal. You saw how little damage the Cortana did to it. It has such high defenses. Um, and of course, body press activating on that defense stat as well, going to be able to deal a lot of damage. The only problem is Reflect has now worn off for Nick's side. So that Sacred Sword is going to be able to do more damage on this next turn. Yeah, and you would imagine now with the Reflect gone, it's going to be able to pick up the knockout and close this one out for Benji. And what is, has been a very... Oh, oh whoa, it survived. Is this going to be enough? Four HP. And oh, wow. the Benny Press Connect. Oh my goodness. Everything just went completely against us. We kind of commentated cursed ourselves there, Lee, a little bit. Yeah. Um, but oh, <laughs> what an amazing comeback for that little Torco. Amazing wow. action there. And huge congratulations to Nick, of course. Yeah, I, I honestly thought Binjie had that wrapped up at that point, but how well is that Torkoal trained? Taking the, the double up from the Cortana and the Rotom Heat, and then taking another additional attack. I mean, big, mm -hmm. big, big achievement there to, to, and how well is it trained? Big congratulations to Nick for that. It's a, a huge thing. And something that's going to worry Benji going into this next game. Now, what we saw in game one was interesting where Nick lost the Torkoal very early on in the game. Mm -hmm. And things didn't really turn out so well for him but we saw how effective that toll call can actually be in an <laughs> end game situation so maybe that's something that he will make and take advantage of going into game three and he's done incredibly well to bring it back and i'm probably sure that obviously he trained that toll call and he probably felt quite comfortable in a position knowing what he needed to do and the lander is there like we mentioned that board position with the lander and the toll call on the field you have to 
almost you're forcing Benji to to make that commitment to deal with the Landorus, otherwise you lose your your Rotom Heat there, or potentially have a fly come out and burn a jealousy or whatever that, that mm -hmm. Benji or the Torco was going to use to potentially knock out the Cartana. So it could get difficult, and I think that just allowed the Torco enough room to kind of get the get the knockouts it needed, and that really very awkward <laughs> terrible situation still can't believe it incredible game and a really good end game there from um, from nick to pull this one back well there were a lot of kind of changes of momentum in that game as well and you know nick did play phenomenally well having that venusaur there out on the field and you know it wasn't in the sun environment and it was still able to thrive really really well and it managed to get all of its dynamax turns was able to boost up a special attack right at the beginning to make the most of it and you know didn't fall for the trap with the cartana switching in going for another max ooze went for that max quake and i think ultimately the one thing that nick did really well that i thought was quite impressive was set up that residual damage very very early on so that it could constantly chip away at binjay's team and you know previously we saw that that dust clock's coming out with the bind as well that's another move that has that residual damage that ticks over for a couple of turns and i think that kind of strategy if you're able to then start off and set up in the way that you need to set up that residual damage and then maybe play a little bit defensively that can really help you out in towards sort of the end game of a match and i mean defensively that tool call was pretty impressive so let's jump into game three and we can see exactly how these players are going to be able to adjust remember this is their final match of this set the winner will be advancing to global finals the loser will be knocked down to the loser's bracket to continue to fight it out for their tournament run it's going to be the venusaur and the grim snarl once again for nick and Binjay not going to change things up either. It's going to be the Urshifu and Clefairy. And once again, the helpful little Clefairy has a plethora of options available to it. Can go for that Helping Hand. We saw how much down damage Helping Hand uh, Wicker Blow did before. Or it could always just go for that Follow Me Redirection strategy. Yeah, that's the the options there are and, and the mind games really come into play now we saw how effective the venusaur was in the longevity of the last game with the the turn one gigantamax and going for that residual damage and we saw how close the urshifu was to a knockout there with a helping hand wicked blow now are we going to see a different approach to this i don't know it's it looks as though we're getting straight into it with nick going for that that gigantamax turn one here yeah, Gigantamax Venusaur back onto the field, but I wonder if Nick's going to go for the same kind of mode. Um, could always potentially play a little bit defensively with the Venusaur, um, just to avoid taking that wicker blow, but no, not at all. Clefairy once again, helping out with the helping hand into the Urshifu. Venusaur, however, does go for that max guard, so Wicker Blow is not going to be able to connect on this occasion, leaving it a little bit vulnerable to a Spirit Break, potentially, from that Grim Snarl. It's exactly what Nick has locked into here. Going to do a huge chunk of damage, but as we saw previously, we know it is not enough to pick up the KO, but critically puts that Urshifu in such a dangerous range of attack. Yeah, but it's still in the position now for Benji where he can still get that huge damage off this next turn with a helping hand, Wicked Blow, and, and lose the Ocean Food for the same return as he got on turn one. But unlike turn one, Nick's kind of down a Dynamax turn, so he's not going to have as many turns to take advantage of his Venusaur here, which makes things a little bit awkward for him. He needs to get this G-Max Vine Lash off here. He needs to start setting up this residual damage because we saw how important it was in game one. Well, this time it's Clefairy going for the Protect. Doesn't want to take one of those max ooze attacks from the Venusaur. Grim's not going to go straight for the Light Screen. Just going to protect the Venusaur from taking any special type attack moves as we're going forward into the game. But Wicker Blow this time is going to connect. It's not helping hand boosted. So the Venusaur is able to hang on and survive much better than it did in the previous game. And able to go for that G-Max Vine Lash. It connects into the Protect of the Clefairy. So it doesn't deal a lot of damage. But the residual setup of those Vines will still go off. So... As you can see, uh, Shifu going to have to take that damage and will be KO'd. Yeah, and that's, a, I think, a really nice and smart play there from Nick. The, the, the Protect there from the Clefairy, interesting as well. It means that Binge is able to preserve it for later on in this game and still maximize the use of it with that redirection and, and make sure that he is disrupting what Nick is trying to do on the field. I do like that play into the Clefairy there, not wasting it into the, the Urshifu, making sure that you do get some damage off into the Clefairy initially. And also, you know that the residual damage is going to be there to, to pick up the knockout onto the Urshifu because of the Spirit break damage that we saw from turn one now the night illegal coming onto the field has to be very wary of a max quake from this venusaur uh but the the one thing that that benji does have going from is that redirection so you can pull away that max quake and take advantage of this maybe meteor beam that we saw in game one to get some big damage which would be enough to pick up the knockout on the venusaur from this range that's the thing though with the Meteor Beam, you can only really use that combination once and it's not like you can kind of go for a rock type move that doesn't have that extra power and 
utilize your item once you lock into it that is the option that you have chosen and you have to sort of follow through with being able to go for that power hub two turn turning into a one charge move the clefairy is going to be going for the follow me i think you're right there lee is the wisest option here for binjay just to protect the um nile go from any of those max quakes and nile go is going to go for that meteor beam of course going to absorb all the space power going to be getting its plus one special attack so that it can deal even more damage power herbs going off here so the two turn charge move is now hitting on this turn but venus not oh. able to survive on five <laughs> hp and can go for that max quake going straight into that clefairy thanks to the redirection not enough to be able to pick up the ko and of course we know the life orb on that venusaur as well is going to be detrimental in keeping venusaur on the field yeah and i, I can't believe the venusaur survived that but you saw <laughs> how useful that light screen was to allow the venusaur to get one last attack off and and boost the special defense on that Grimmsnarl, which is very important here. Uh, you know, the, the Nile Eagle already got that, that plus one in special attacks. are so going to be very threatening. And the, any any additional boosts that you can have on top of that light screen are going to be very helpful against these this huge special attacker here. Now, Nick has expended his Dynamax turns, but I think he's played them well. He's got the most out of them, and he's still got that residual damage, which will be chipping down on Binjay's side of the field every turn from now. But uh, still a lot to do, but the Dusclops introduction is an interesting one where he can maybe take advantage of the speed dimensions here. Yeah, that's the thing. And as well, you know, I think a critical thing was removing that Clefairy from the field. Binjay no longer has options to go for that redirect, won't be able to get extra offensive pressure with Helping Hand, and doesn't have the extra defensive support with Friend Guard. So removing it definitely makes Nick's life a little bit easier going into this match. Dusclops as well, like you said, could easily try and twist up the speed dimensions and give Nick that advantage, but could also go for that bind that we saw in game one and sort of keep that residual damage flowing through the rest of Binjay's team, you know, having the Vine Lash set up and then having Bind. It's just going to keep chipping away. Yeah, and the nice secondary effect to bind as well is it prevents your opponent from switching out, so it would trap a Pokemon on the field. So if you can get a Trick Room set up with Dusclops and in a nice position where you can get a bind off onto something like the Rotom Heat, you can really pin it down and, and make it a lot easier of a threat to deal with than you would without that, that, that option there. Well, this is something I have yet to see. It is a Dynamax Nihiligo, looking quite terrifying in that larger form. Um, and it's going to be able to go for this Max Ooze, which again, slightly scary. We know that it boosts the special attack, and that will be of both the Nihiligo and the Rotom that's just joined the field. So Nihiligo will now be sitting at... Um, I think it's plus two as the Spirit Break went into the Clefairy and Rotom will be at plus one. And if Rotom um, wants to go on the offensive, as you can see it going for here with the Thunderbolt, it's going to be dealing even more damage. But Grim's not able to hang on and goes for that Spirit Break. Connects onto the Rotom, going to be able to bring it right back down to neutral. Yeah, negating that 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 boost from the Maxus is a really nice play there. And I still can't believe the defensive capabilities of Nick's team. They're incredible <laughs> as the Dusclops now is able to set that Trick Room up. And the residual damage is continuing to chip away at Benji's team. Now, I'm not in a very favorable position here. But again, I don't think the Nihiligos in, or either the Rotom are in any any danger of getting knocked out here. So I think the, um, Benji will be able to get attacks off. The Grimmsnarl at risk of getting knocked out, but it does have access to maybe go for one more spirit break to reduce the the attack stat from the the Nihiligo, which might be a good option or that rotom heat if he chooses to dusclops sitting here as you've mentioned already lou has access to that bind and will be able to start stacking up that residual damage which is going to be something very important i think to try and close this end game out Exactly, with Trick Room in effect as well. Dust Swap's going to be moving first on the field, going for that Nightshade, taking 50 HP away from the Rotom. Will, of course, activate the Berry, but then that's not something the Rotom has to fall back on later on in the game. So just going to regain a little bit of health for now um, as Grimmsnarl goes for that Spirit Break. So Trick Room really playing to the advantage of Nick here, targeting down into that Rotom once again. It's now going to be at minus one and gets a critical hit as well for some style points there, really kind of trying to penalize the Rotom for daring to have its Berry and regaining some HP earlier in the turn. Rotom, however, now going to go, of course, for that nasty plot we've seen it go for before. It's now going to be at plus one special attack as Nihiligo goes for the Max Ooze, going to connect onto the Grim Snarl, pick up the KO, and boost up the special attack once again of Nihiligo and the Rotom, which I believe is going to bring it back up to plus two. The Nihiligo, however, sitting at plus three, is it going to get a special attack beast boost as well? 
Yeah, and you can see that activating on top of that. And then Max Zoo's combination with that Beast Boost is a very nasty, important combination here. The Naya Liga is extremely powerful right now. And it's something that, I don't know, it depends what the last Pokemon Nick has in the back to come in. Can it deal with the Naya Liga in the, this Trick Room environment? Because that's going to be the, the biggest concern for him right now, dealing with it. And, and you know... I don't know, it's just so overpowered right now and it's not just the Nihiligo you need to worry about, it's that Rotom as well sitting next to it, Benji putting all the concentration not only down on the Nihiligo but by going for that nasty plot it's meant that you can't ignore the Rotom either because both are huge threats going into this next turn, although the Rotom in a bit of a precarious position because a Nightshade can just pick up the knockout from the Dusclops so whether or not Benji wants to try and go for a Protector to preserve it a turn it'll be interesting to see. Well, I think he was listening, Lee. Does indeed preserve the Rotom, go for that Protect. Dusclops' Nightshade not going to be able to connect, of course, as Glastria goes for that high horsepower touch down into the Nightligo, and it is enough to pick up the KO with a critical hit and just remove it completely from the field. This plus four Nightligo that was looking so formidable has now been removed, and Nick, I think, can breathe a big sigh of relief. Glastria, of course, going to get his Chilling Nay ability activated. We'll get a plus one attack stat, and, of course, Trick Room is still in effect at the moment. The Rotom looking so precarious against Nightshade followed up by the Glastria. I mean, there's not a lot Rotom can do in this situation. Not a lot at all, especially when the dimensions are, are twisted like this and everything slower on the field is going to move first. And that knockout there onto the Glastria was, was huge there for